In the early 1980s, Mercedes-Benz released a car which was unlike any they had ever released before. In many ways, it changed the face of the company forever. This was that car, and this is the story of how it came about. Mercedes-Benz passenger car lineup wasn't always the vast selection it is now. Once upon a time, there wasn't even a C-Class. Mercedes had toyed with introducing a smaller saloon on occasion during the post-war years, but these efforts never progressed past prototypes. Mercedes' reputation, in those days especially, was as a maker of large, prestigious luxury cars. There was considerable opposition within the company against building smaller, cheaper cars which might harm their brand image. The year 1973 was to change all of that. Mercedes said the decision to finally proceed with a smaller car was made early in the year at the Geneva Motor Show, but events later that year were to cement the decision and make it a top priority. In the wake of the Yom Kippur War, members of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, announced an oil embargo on countries which were perceived to have supported Israel. Chief among these was the United States, and the resulting oil crisis there sent prices of petrol and diesel skyrocketing. By 1975, the US Congress had passed what came to be known as CAFE, or Corporate Average Fuel Economy Rules, which stipulated that a manufacturer's range of cars must meet stringent standards on average fuel economy. Mercedes' range of luxury cars would not meet these strict rules. The US was Mercedes' largest export market. You can see the problem. By 1976, the new compact Mercedes had a chassis code, W201. The project was led by Werner Breitschwert. The new car had to be every bit a Mercedes-Benz. No compromise in build quality, comfort, safety or technology. However, it did have to differ from its stablemates on fuel economy and size. The car was strictly a four-door saloon and aimed at new customers, customers under 30 to tempt people away from BMW's 3 Series. Now the car's design would be the work of Bruno Sacco, whose first car for Mercedes-Benz had been the W126 S-Class of 1979. The 190 would share a family resemblance to that car, but with an emphasis on aerodynamics and a wedge shape which had never been before seen on a production Mercedes. Now the car would debut with a single arm wiper. On early cars, this was a simple affair around a fixed point in the center of the windscreen, but it didn't clear as much of the windscreen as Mercedes had hoped only something like 76%, which wasn't even as much as the two-bladed W123. In 1985, they introduced the eccentric sweep, which is a clever mechanism which pushes the wiper blade up into the each corner of the windscreen. And in that way, it cleared about 86% of the windscreen, or more than any other car on the road at the time. The windscreen was bonded. The traditional method of a rubber seal with a chrome strip through it disrupts the airflow. Now the rear edge of the bonnet is swooped upwards. This protects the mono wiper from the airflow and creates a nice aerodynamic flow over the car. The rear quarter has an aerodynamic chamfer on the edges. Even the wheel trims are shaped for airflow and to direct cooling air into the brakes. These grey plastic trims weren't initially liked compared to the uh, traditional chrome and colour-coded hubcaps found on the likes of the 123. The big engineering revelation of the W201 was in its suspension. The design brief had called for a car that was every bit of Mercedes, but the size constraints made this a difficult task. The engineers at Stuttgart trialled 77 different setups on quick change test mules. The result was a completely new design. Rear suspension is what came to be known as 5-point multi-link. This system is lighter than the conventional semi-trailing arms Mercedes was using at the time. The system very cleverly prevents excessive camber change and changes of attitude under acceleration and braking. A similar system had been tried on the earlier prototype C111 sports cars, but that differed considerably from the final production version. Petrol engines would be carried over from the entry level W123s, which had received the M102 during their 1980 refresh. This was a lightweight, single overhead cam engine, 
which in its 2-litre guise would power the bulk of European W201s in either carbureted or fuel-injected form. For the US market, where emissions control measures sapped performance, the extant 2.3 injected version from the 230E would be sold. Eventually a 6-cylinder 2.6-litre version of the new M103 engine would be introduced. As for diesel motors, a new family of modular diesels have been under development since 1977. This would eventually be the OM601, 602 and 603 engines. The 601 and 602 would find their way into the W201 as the 2 litre and the 5 cylinder 2.5 litre displacement respectively. When it came to naming the new car, Mercedes had a dilemma. To this point, model numbers referring to engine size, roughly, and suffixes had been employed. A 280E was a W123, a 280SE was a W126, a 280SL was an R107. These cars had to be placed below the entry level executive cars. It wouldn't have been appropriate for the 2 litre W201 to be badged the same as the more expensive 2 litre W123. Mercedes went with the number 190, which had been seen on the 1.9 litre Fintail and Ponton models during the 1960s. Cars would be badged as 190 for a petrol carburetor car, 190E for a petrol injected car, or 190D for diesel. Another badge on the right hand side of the boot lid might tell you the car's displacement, if optioned. The launch of the new compact Mercedes was keenly awaited at Mercedes-Benz UK in Brentford. The UK would in fact go on to become the largest European market for the 190 outside of Germany. Jonathan Ashman was product manager at MB UK at the time. Responsibility for the UK launch of the new car fell to him. Richard Mason previously caught up with him to chat about this important moment in Mercedes history. The UK team had to wait 9 months from the German car launch for a right hand drive example of the car. In the meantime, a left hand drive model was delivered for every department at Brentford to get familiarised with. Jonathan remembers that a draft press pack came with the car, with poor translations such as arms waving about in the air for the multi link rear suspension. Marketing the car for the UK would fall to the Brentford team. By 1980, the fuel crisis that necessitated a smaller Mercedes had largely gone away. There were still doubts that a small car might ruin Mercedes' image as a luxury automaker. Thus, the public would have to be reassured completely that this new model was still a Mercedes-Benz. The word small was to be avoided at all costs. Jonathan decided to commission a video to be shown at a five-day press and dealer launch. Three creative companies were asked to pitch, with some opting to show the new York car outside Harrods or Wimbledon. Jonathan felt that these were a bit too obvious and that people would see through it. Jonathan turned to Brian Robbins, who was working for the BBC. Robbins suggested taking the car to Siena, an area of Italy associated with the Mille Miglia, and having Sterling Moss drive the route while reminiscing about his 1955 win, while comparing the new 190. This would portray the car as more of a tourer than a car with a sporting image. But I can remember very much because the, the Italians would turn up literally in their millions and would sit there waving you on and doing you know, the typical Italian gestures and so on, trying to get you to go so fast you'd have a shunt, I suppose. It's difficult to think of a more suitable place to try out a new car than Siena in Tuscany. In addition to this, Joanna Lumley was approached to film segments in Siena itself to promote the car's suitability for town driving. Suddenly turning very sharply, and it handled like a kitten, it skipped along. The launch was set for the 7th of June 1983 at Effingham Park in Surrey. The video was shot just one month before, using three right-hand drive 190Es which had been pre-registered on UK plates in Stuttgart and driven straight from there to Siena. Sterling and Joanna flew out to meet the crew. While a script was prepared for Sterling, Jonathan recalls he did everything off the cuff, simply describing the car as he found it. It's very light, it's positive, and I, I th it's another of good features. I think it's, very, it's a very definite um, type of steering. When, when, you, when you place it, you feel the car's going to go there, and it's going there without, there's no feedback. It, it is a very nice steering. Sterling was natural and really enjoyed the whole experience. Joanna preferred to use the script. I don't drive like Sterling Moss, but even at the reasonable speeds I do in England, I find that with the decreasing surfaces of the road, really you can have quite a bumpy ride. This goes beautifully, smooth as a French double bed, which is rather a rude way of saying it's extremely nice. The video was to be done to a high standard, without being lavish. Money was there if required, but not simply thrown at it. Special permission was given to film Joanna's sequence in the centre of Siena where Jonathan also remembers accidentally spilling coffee on her dress. During the filming, an elderly Italian recognised Sterling Moss. 
And although he spoke little English, was able to point to a wall outside of a cafe where Sterling's average stage time during that section of the Mealy Melia had been scribbled, still visible. Within minutes, a small crowd of fans had gathered around. The launch was a success, and the video was sent to dealers where customers could watch it in the showrooms. Jonathan's team at Brentford then had to focus on getting the new car in enough volume to satisfy demand. He says this wasn't so much of an issue with the 190, with examples arriving from Germany in larger numbers than previous new models. Stuttgart pressured Mercedes UK to take the diesels, which were very popular in Germany. The UK hadn't yet taken to diesel cars as much, and the petrol-engined 190E would be the dominant seller in this market. In the late 1970s, Mercedes had considerable success in rally, with the 450 SLC and 280Es enjoying wins in the London to Sydney and East African Safari, among others. This was recognised for the marketing tool that it was, and the company was focused, for a time, on developing a rally car to compete against the likes of the Ford Escort, which was dominating the sport by the early 1980s. British engineering firm Cosworth were approached to develop a four-valve head for the M102 engine, with a view to producing a performance version of the 190. This would also give Mercedes experience in the field of multi-valve engine design. Unfortunately, in the background, Audi released the Quattro. Its four-wheel drive system rendered rear-wheel drive rally cars uncompetitive overnight, and the rally project was duly scrapped. However, the work on the Cosworth head was not scrapped, and the decision was made to refocus on touring car racing instead. The cars took shape as the 190E 2.3-16. The 2.3-litre M102 engine had been mated to the new Cosworth 16-valve head. Three pilot production cars were taken to Nardo in August 1983 and used to take a series of speed records which would highlight the car's durability and performance. 18 drivers ran the cars flat out for 8 days and nights. 12 records were set, including distance records for 50,000 kilometers, over which the cars achieved an average of 154 miles an hour. The 16-valve cars could be distinguished by a body kit not found on the standard 190 models, including chin spoiler, side skirts and boot spoiler. This served to slightly lower the coefficient of drag from the already impressive 0.33 to 0.32. Mercedes wanted to draw attention to the new 16-valve cars when they were approaching production in 1984. It just so happened that this would coincide with the reopening of the Nürburgring Grand Prix circuit. For 50 years, the castle and the village of Nürburgring in the Eiffel Mountains of West Germany overlooked the longest and most difficult motor racing circuit in the world, the Nürburgring. But after a near-fatal crash in the 1970s involving world champion Niki Lauda, the ring was rebuilt at a cost of over £20 million and it opened again on the 12th of May 1984. Mercedes teamed up with the owners to host a race to inaugurate the new Grand Prix circuit. This will be a by invitation, one make only race, using 20 pilot production 2.3 16-valve 190Es. The cars were prepared almost to showroom specification, with only the addition of bucket seats, harnesses and a simple roll cage. Ride height was 15mm lower than standard, and the final drive was shorter. They would be raced by a troupe of current and future racing stars for maximum publicity. Each car was numbered with the driver's name decaled on the doors and sunstrip. Household Grand Prix driver names graced the grid, such as Lauda, Moss, Prost, Reusemann, Rosberg, Surtees, Hunt. But the eventual winner of the race was a young up-and-comer by the name of Ayrton Senna. Many of the cars were displayed in dealerships for a time, with Senna's car going to the Mercedes-Benz Museum. From their collection, we have it on display today. The 2.3-16 was superseded by the 2.5-16 in 1989. This was a response to the road-going BMW M3, with which, in racing form, the 190 was doing battle on the German touring car circuits. With the advent of the 2.5, Mercedes would give official factory support to the touring car teams. The new 2.5 engine replaced the single-row timing chain of the earlier engines with a duplex chain, 
A change also implemented on the more standard 190Es due to issues arising from this single road chain. It was at this point the 190 received a facelift in the form of what are known to enthusiasts as Sacco panels. Although some complained that this made the standard 190s look a little bit too much like the 16 valve models. One drawback of the M102, at least to the touring car teams, was the engine's relatively long stroke. This would have been fine for the rally car it was envisaged as, but for touring, high revs would be needed. The only way to achieve this would be to create a short stroke version of the engine. Cosworth further tweaked their cylinder head to complete the short stroke M102. These cars would be known as the Evolution models which in addition to the high performance engines would have larger wheels, larger brakes and a quicker steering ratio. Called officially the 190E 2.516 Evolution, 502 examples of what would become known as the Evo 1 were built to homologate the race car. All were left hand drive and all were blue black metallic. By the end of the 1989 season however, it was obvious that more would need to be done to be competitive against the M3. The Evolution 2 was born with a suite of adjustable spoilers and wings that was like nothing previously seen on a Mercedes-Benz. We have a replica of an Evo 2 here today, built by D-Class. As Mercedes entered the 1990s, the final few years of the 190E were marked with the introduction of a new engine, the 1.8. This was designed to replace the carbureted 2.0-litre car, as the company moved towards fuel injection on all models for stricter emissions controls. In 1993, the 190 gave way to the new W202C class as Mercedes brought its nomenclature in across the range. The last UK 190Es were imported in September 1993, ending 10 years of the baby bends on the UK market.